Well, hello, viewers. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm here with Frederica Brillenborg, who I've known for at least half of my life, I would say. We've been friends forever. And uh, she's a, a, one of the founding board members of Catapult Opera. And so I wanted to chat with her as I'm going to be chatting with a number of board members uh, because they're, one thing they all have in common is that they're all extraordinary and have extraordinary backgrounds in different ways. And Frederica is among the most extraordinary. Um, so I wanted to people to get to know her. And then we'll, at some point, we'll get into the discussion about um, what about Catapult and its mission uh, she, find, she found attractive enough to want to be part of it. So let's start with um, Frederica, your life and your background. You're a native New Yorker, is that correct? I'm a native New Yorker, yeah, born and bred on the Upper East Side. Okay. And uh, yeah. And, and, and did you go to high school here? I did. I went to the Brearley School actually for 13 years, oh. an all girl school. Okay. But not 13 <laughs> years of high school. No, no. <laughs> I was going to say, no, my no. Yeah, no, that, uh, the serious risk, the serious <laughs> problem. Then. No, I went to Brearley and then I went to Vassar College. And why did you decide to go to Vassar? Were you planning on being a music major? I was planning on being a music major and, um, and I was choosing actually between Vassar and Northwestern. And my father had come with me to look at the schools. And he said, the way that we choose is that Northwestern had a beautiful new music building on the lake, but the practice rooms had views of the lake, but upright Yamaha pianos. And Vassar had an old ivy covered Gothic music building with Steinway Grands in the practice rooms on, on, oh, in the basement. So that was the basis of the choice. <laughs> That's what he said. Choose between the Steinway Grands in the ivy covered building or the view of the lake with the Yamaha uprights. So uh, you didn't consider going to conservatory? I didn't during college because I wasn't sure yet uh, what I wanted to do. I mean, I knew that I wanted to study music. I thought I wanted to sing. Um, but I wasn't sure yet, so I just went to get a liberal arts education. Although, oh I yeah, your interests have always been very, very broad and wide ranging. Yeah. It seems to me. And I think, as an opera singer, um, in a way, conservatory, to be honest, is not so necessary to make a career. I never went to, to one. I came back from Vassar, and I did put in an application to Manhattan School of Music and Juilliard, and then I withdrew them before the process uh, went through. Um, I studied, you know, I took Italian at the Italian Cultural Institute. I took acting classes. I coached with you. I huh. coached with lots well, of Well, I people. think you probably knew what you needed more than you didn't need someone to tell you what well, you needed. I think also that because voices develop later than, you know, 18, 19, or even 22, I had a, a little bit bigger voice. I mean, I was a lyric in the beginning, but, um, and I think that singers, we need a background in literature, in languages, in philosophy, in art history, um, because all of these culture. Add to cu culture, you know, humanistic studies, because mm -hmm. I think as, a, as an opera singer, you're, you have to be an actor, a musician, um, you have to sort of understand a context of history. And, um, and I think that was very important to me. And I really got that at Vassar. It was a wonderful liberal arts college. And so that was- So yeah, it was the right I, choice for you. It really was. Yeah, no, I think that I'm a music, I'm, I'm an opera singer partly because of Vassar. They had an incredible music library. And, you know, I just took out uh, to date myself a million records. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they even had some alumna had given them a subscription to the Met, these incredible seats Saturday night in the front row dress circle, and nobody else used them very often. So I used them all the time because I'd come home to New York and I'd go to the opera on Saturday night. The and then Vassar. you could spend the night at home before going back exactly. to Vassar. Exactly. Oh, how perfect. How yeah. perfect. So the school encouraged you to do outside activities. Yes, I mean, there, they just had that offering if you were somebody who wanted to take advantage of it. And, um, and that was something that, that, you know, I love to do and continued when I got out of school. I was in New York and I was working in a, in a classical CD shop. And as well, I had the luck on, on the Upper East Side on 75th Street. It was called Orpheus. 
um, the, it was owned by a bunch of different people. One of them, the man who started it, I think you know Michael Thomas. Mm -hmm. um, and there were a lot of uh, a lot of people gave money to the shop to start this shop, and they were all patrons of the Philharmonic and the Opera and the Ballet and Carnegie Hall. So being a, a young, you know, 22, 23 year old woman working in this shop i got tons of tickets to see everything if somebody couldn't go they drop off the ticket and and or they tons of exposure to lots of different types of people interesting people yes yes uh -huh. very interesting people <laughs> and, and as well i was sort of the, the there were we had two groups of men who ran the shop one was this wonderful crazy guy from montana um, who taught me about, you know, Michael Rabin playing the violin or um, what is his name, Pertile, the, the oh, Italian the, uh, tenor, or, you know, he had a, a fondness for strange, um, there was a, a baritone from Australia named Peter Dawson that every, yeah. every doyen on the Upper East Side, he got to, to buy the complete Peter Dawson. Wow. And he also educated me in, you know, which of the Beethoven symphonies, who was the best conductor for each symphony, best orchestra, things like that. And then he left. And then the next man who came to run the shop um, was, had been the A&R director at London Records in the 50s and made all the Tibaldi Di Stefano records. Who's that? His name was Remy Farkas. Okay. And, um, and so he... He also, I mean, they, they love to, to educate me because I was a young uh -huh. girl at that time and they'd sit and play, play recordings for me and tell me stories. And, and you were happy to be educated. Exactly. Well, it was, I mean, it was just as probably as good an education of, as being at a conservatory, you know, listen, yeah. you know, who to listen to of the old singers. It was fantastic. And didn't you say you got educated in other human activities too? Didn't you say that there were, there were wild goings on in the stock room and such? Oh, no, no, <laughs> there were just some things like the, the David, the first owner, you know, like to single malt scotches. And <laughs> I'd have to make his hangover drink, which was a disgusting mixture of ginger ale, Alka-Seltzer and grape juice. <laughs> no, thank you. Okay. Well, that, there's lessons to be learned there too. Yes, exactly. You never know when it might come in handy. It, so. it probably has many times for, for your friends. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's so gross, disgusting. <laughs> but, um, no, it was, it was very interesting. And I met, I met also, you know, all the critics from the New York Times, Tim Page came in, John Rockwell, Alan Cozen, everybody was a, a shopper there. So there was a lot of record collectors. And so so was, did you get this job right out of school? Yeah, pretty much. I had another, briefly another job first, but I walked in there, I was working as a PA for a tel television commercial production company. And I walked into the shop one day and, um, and this uh, Brahms piano trio playing, uh -huh. which happened to be my father's favorite uh, uh -huh. piano trio. And so I said to David, who was the, the manager then, I said, oh, this is my father's favorite <laughs> piano trio. And he said, this is my mother's favorite piano trio. How oh, great, the B major probably. Uh -huh. yeah, exactly. So, so I had to come back, I don't know, about 10 times before I got hired, but he kept having me come back. And then finally his wife, who was the bookkeeper, left to work on Wall Street and there was an opening for me. So how fabulous. It, it just was the whole atmosphere. You know, I thought I was in there with this fantastic music playing uh, and I thought what a wonderful uh, working situation rather than bringing coffee for people exactly. on set and uh, being- So it sounds like they were a bunch of characters too. Absolutely, major characters. And there. the customers as well, probably. Yeah, the customers. There was a restaurant on 75th Street on the corner called Mortimer's. 75th oh, yeah. Washington. And so the the whole society of the Upper East Side would have their lunch and a few drinks, and then they'd roll out and come in. <laughs> and then we'd and, and advise them. them. We'd advise them, and they'd buy three copies of everything, you know, one for New York, one for Southampton, one for Aspen. Or Fabulous. Else. It was great. And did you yeah. get paid on commission? No. Oh, no. that's too bad. <laughs> no, but it, it, was, it was a very, um, no, I mean, it was kind of a really interesting education, actually. So were you I mean, living at home through this period? I was living at home for the, maybe the first year, and then I had my own apartment on uh -huh. 72nd and 2nd. And year. were you singing while you, as well? I was, yes. I was taking lessons, and um, and I you know, was I was studying Italian at the Italian Cultural Institute on Park Avenue, and I was taking singing lessons, and I was coaching, and 
Yeah, with the idea that uh, that I wanted to be an opera singer. At some I don't point, know yeah. what that meant, but mm -hmm. but yes. Did you have people to to mentor you and advise you about what it really meant and what a career like that would entail? Actually, I have to say my career, as as you know, is quite different than most opera singers. I started. You've made your own career. Hey, I really made my own career. I mean, I did a lot of other things. I got married uh, very early. Um, and, you know, I never, I sort of, I had a million different teachers. I never kind of settled with one teacher that really was my mentor, I would say. And um, I just, I knew I had something, but, um, but I, I was never really guided and helped. And in fact, I mean, my career started not until my 30s, and it happened quite um, after a tragic accident. My husband died in a in a climbing accident in in California. Did you have your child yet? I did. My son Gustavo was uh, not quite two years old. Okay, he was still an infant. And, um, and right after that, uh, James King was a James King's wife was a friend of my mother-in-law's and he was in New York uh, singing in Electra at the Met. And, you know, he knew about what had happened to me and heard I was an opera singer. And so he said, told my mother-in-law, tell Frederica to call me and she can come over the Met and sing for me. So, you know, this was in, I don't know, maybe six months after my husband died. So I went over to the Met in his dressing room and I sang a couple arias for him. And he said, oh, great. Why don't you come and do my master class this summer in Munich? I do one every summer at uh, the Prince Regenten Theater. It was called the Münchener Singschule. I'm not sure if they have it anymore. And so um, then though became the crisis of how to get me into the school because I couldn't fly over to Munich. I had a little tiny son, two and a half years old to do an audition. So he came up with an idea to see if he could get Hildegard Behrens to hear me sing. Okay. Um, and so he kept waiting to ask her when she, she was singing Electra, then she uh -huh. was singing Senta and Fliegen to Hollander. And um, he, he kept not being able to find her, but she had a very close friend, uh, a man named Gaston Ormazabal. Um, and he found Gaston, I think in the canteen at the Metropolitan Opera. And he said, Gaston, I really want uh, Hildegard to hear this girl who I'd like to, to have her write a letter for. And, and Gaston said, oh, well, you know, who is it? And so uh, James said, it's Frederica Brillenborg. And he said, oh, is she Venezuelan? Because my husband was Venezuelan. And, and James said, no, but her husband was. And Gaston said, oh, I knew her husband. I went to college with him at Harvard. I loved her husband. He uh -huh. wrote poetry and climbed rocks. <laughs> and I'll make sure that Hildegard hears her. Fabulous. And that's what happened. So uh -huh. I, I did the Licia Albanese Puccini competition. And Gaston and Hildegard came. And she wrote me a recommendation letter to August Everding who was at that time the intendant of the Bayerische Staatsoper, and I got in the program. So when went, at that time, were you a soprano or a mezzo? I was a mezzo. I was okay. back to being a mezzo. Back to mezzo. Because yeah, uh, I, I, I feel like I'm partially <laughs> responsible for that. You yeah. are. I was, you know, I started life as a mezzo, mezzo, and then there was this period where everybody from, you know, well, Joan Dorneman started it, and then it, kind of snowballed and uh, where uh, they thought maybe I was a soprano because I had easy high C and, and it, it was completely wrong. Um, and, uh, but I spent three years trying to be a soprano and I could sing a little bit of everything, you know, um, but it was, I could never find the right fach or, you know, genre of type of soprano. And, um, and actually you said one day I came to a coaching with you and I had brought Marguerite's aria from Buno's Faust. And you said, well, I'd really like to hear you sing Sia Bell. And I said, well, what do you mean, Neil? You know, you know <laughs> I'm singing the soprano stuff. And then you told me to go uh, work with Ruth Falcon. And I went to her and she said, um, the bad news is you're not a soprano, but the good news is, is you're a really good mezzo. Yeah, I remember basically saying the same thing. I said, you could work, you'll work a really long time and really hard, and you might be able to eke out some sort of a career as a soprano. I said, but you could turn around tomorrow and have a fabulous career as a mezzo. And I was immediately, I got cast, uh, and, uh, and then 
when I came over to do this masterclass, I sang in the, um, there was a final concert at the Bayerische Staatsoper and an agent heard me. And, what did you sing? Do you remember? Yes, I sang the duet uh, from Barbara of Seville. Okay. Dunque io song. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, uh, with the baritone. And, uh, and then I got cast in a, um, as to sing Orlovsky in a that suburb is. of Munich. And, and it was Orlovsky who had to have a high C because Orlovsky was having a, in, in the party scene, there was going to be a coloratura battle between Orlovsky and Adele singing the Frühlingsstimme Vals. Jeez, okay. <laughs> so that's why I got the job. And anyway, that brought me back to Germany. And then I went and auditioned um, and I did five auditions and got two offers for fest positions in Bremen and Ulm and a guest position in um, Klagenfurt, Austria. So I ended up taking Bremen took a two-year contract and came over in 1995 with my son who was four. We moved to Bremen, I thought for two years. Um, did you come with a nanny or did you get one there or did they um, have- no, I brought, Yeah, I brought a, a, a housekeeper from Peru mm -hmm. who, who was with me, which was, thank God. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I dove in, I went from singing like three performances a year to 50 performances <laughs> and my- All leading my roles. Yeah, no, my first season was amazing. I basically got cast to sing Charlotte in Werther. I sang the composer in Ariadne, Afnaxus, Hensel in Hensel and Gretel, uh, Madalena Rigoletto and Suzuki in Madame Butterfly. Okay. That was my first season. So, And when um, did Carmen happen? Carmen was then the following season. Was my and that sort of was season. your, was your yeah, Charlotte ticket kind of fame? Charlotte put, you know, I was listed in the Opernwelt Nachwuchskunstlerin, which is, you know, the, the uh, you know, future mm -hmm. potential stars. And then the, when I did Carmen the following year, I got on the cover of Opernwelt and we had a very special production uh, by a theater director named Karen Beyer, who in the Carmen was her very first opera. Um, and it was it was a wonderful production. And she came, the Don Jose was English. Uh, he was a tenor named Bruce Rankin. And uh, in the rehearsals, we were doing the dialogues in French. The first rehearsal, she arrived with a big drum, a big trombola and uh -huh. somebody playing it. And we um, improvised all of the dialogues in English or not speaking like the Segadia, you know, we had a rope and a stool and the drummer played the drum and, and it was, yeah, it was amazing. We worked like actors and uh, and then, you know, we'd be improvising or improvising the, di the dialogue in English and or some other variation. And then suddenly she'd start the piano and we'd go into the to the French and it made the, the drama incredibly powerful. Mm. And I sang that production, I think, like 70 times. Good Lord. Um, <laughs> Over did, 10 did years. Have, did you have any time to sort of uh, think about or contemplate the sort of changes in your life that happened so quickly and that it was, you, or did you just sort of go with the flow? Well, no, it was, I mean, for me, it was a little bit because, you know, as I said, I'd sort of gone from really not, I mean, I, I was a hobby singer, I, to right. be honest, I would say, I mean, I did a couple of little recitals and the, the Bronx opera and the Brooklyn lyric opera. Mm -hmm. But um, so for a while, I would just be pinching myself you know, and sort of saying, you really are an opera singer. <laughs> you really are an opera singer. And um, yeah, I mean, I wasn't sure if I was, a, you know, imposter up there, but, but I had so much, um, I think, you know, back to an education and being a humanist, I had a lot of life experience. You know, yes. I was in my thirties. I had a tragedy of, you know, loving and losing the mm -hmm. love of my life. I'd had a child. Um, I moved to a foreign country. I uh, left growing up in New York. Um, I, I mean, now when I look back, I have no idea how I did it. It was so, I, I you know, I, I just think I was putting one foot before the, the exactly. next. Exactly. That's what I was thinking. That uh, but, it, but there, you know, there were various moments, you know, and also it, it wasn't easy. You know, it was really being a single mother. Did you have a support team? Because your father was already gone by then, yes? Yeah, my father had died shortly before my husband. So no, not, I mean, you know, of course, you know, your my mom. mother in New York and she'd come over and 
and my sister, but, and my in-laws, my husband's family came to visit, but no, I was on my own in Bremen wow. with my son and, and, and the, this wonderful housekeeper. And I mean, I made friends there, but it was, it's lonely because you're singing when you're fest in, in a theater, you're working, we were working six days a week at that time. And sometimes even seven, if you had a performance on Sunday, you'd have rehearsals mornings and evenings, five days a week, Saturday mornings, and then you could have performances throughout that time as well. So I wasn't exactly out on the town the nights right. that I wasn't working. So, and with five productions, that meant there were uh, three of the productions were new productions, which meant six weeks of rehearsal periods. And then at that time, we did also sometimes 20 shows of an opera. And, um, and it was also repertory. So you might have in a week, you might sing, I don't know, two performances of Carabino, a Carmen, and be rehearsing Paulina and Peak Dom in the morning. So it. Mm -hmm. it was a real lesson in how to, how to sing, how to perform, how to act, how to memorize the music, how to remember where to go, how to work with your colleagues, how to um, adapt to a new conductor, a new colleague, because in opera, the other thing that's so, it's not like a, in the theater where you rehearse with the with the ensemble with the group and then you always perform with those same people in opera somebody gets sick at noon they cancel they bring somebody flies in and you might meet them an hour before go through the the blocking of the scene but it's not or you or you're suddenly singing with the second cast even though you only rehearsed with the first cast and so you're just you have to be extremely adaptable but it was it was an amazing education. It was easy afterwards to be freelance and just go work on one opera at a time. You know? It sounds like uh, the most important thing or one of the most important things that your parents gave you was a positive attitude and a resilience to be able to sort of pick yourself up after all you'd been through and just move forward with your life instead of just putting the sheets over your head. Well, I think having a, a little child yeah, really helped that because I couldn't just get in bed and never get <laughs> out. And, um, but but yeah, no, I sort of, I mean, for me, I, I guess the thing that motivated made me in a way is, you know, I lost my father and lost my husband. And I wanted to know that I could take care of myself in the future, that I wouldn't be dependent on someone that I could manage my life and my son's life. And, um, and also the music was this incredible gift. And you know, all the emotion that was going on, I had a place to put it and mm -hmm. you know, I'd be on the stage and I, I just would feel so grateful. Um, you know, I mean, I'm not really religious, but if there was a religion, if there was a God, he was coming through this music and, and, and it was, you know, certain parts came to me at moments that I needed them. Like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I mean, Charlotte was a very um, cathartic cathartic and 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 sad I mean that music every time it starts it makes me cry because of the <laughs> time and and butterfly also but then came Carmen and so I sort of started to have fun in Carmen uh -huh. again and then my third season I did an amazing production that Christoph Loy directed of uh, Gluck's Orfe Orfe Orfeo but in the French Berlioz edition Orfe and um and he the idea was that I was a conductor and that once I lost um, Eurydice, that that was when I really started to have my musical success, which was sort of my story. Yeah. Uh -huh. And um, did so he that, plan it that way? Did he know your story? He, yeah, he knew me because we had done we had done Verter together. Okay. And um, so it was really very deep and moving. so you were the inspiration for his concept. It sounds yeah. like yeah, yeah. That and it was an incredible production with beautiful dancers, and it was a very very special production. So one one of the best things I ever did, I think. So. And did you like doing trouser rolls? Um, I did. They were fun. I mean, I love doing something like Orfe or doing the composer or um, Carabino, of course, was was a ball, although I didn't really do it. I didn't do it until my fifth season. So, um, you know, Hensel, they made fun of me. The the dramaturg made fun of me at the theater. He's now the intendant of the Deutsche Oper because... Why? Well, I was like being a, a, a farm boy. An know? American boy. An American boy, a little bit, I guess. Uh -huh. I see. Uh -huh. Yeah. No, I I liked I liked pants rolls, but it was, but I also I'm quite feminine as uh -huh. a person. Also, right. so I was always a very elegant boy, in general. Even when I tried to be a farm hand, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so, so I've always been a little bit better at the the more 
kind of regal and uh -huh. the and, and andro androgynous androgynous voice. yeah and i mean actually I played, the first the carmen that i did i did a carmen later with a, a director named werner schröter who was a filmmaker and a director and and i was a very an androgynous carmen in that mm -hmm. you know i was in a, a, a um a jumpsuit and I think he wanted. I think he wanted to be Carmen, so I just was him. <laughs> Which most often directors want you to be them, so that's uh, another part is of figuring out how to mold yourself into their vision. And uh, yeah, so I mean, I you know, there's a fine line in many of these figures. And then as you get as a woman getting older and and getting a more dramatic voice, of course, then there are these amazing female, really female characters. Mm -hmm. The opportunities open up in a different way, yeah. also because you have so much enormous success in the characters that you'd put your stamp on already. Yeah. People trusted you and believed you and yes. could extrapolate. And no, I was, and I was very lucky. I mean, because again, over here, uh, where I'm in Germany right now, but again, you know, I didn't have one agent that sort of took me through in my career. I had various agents, so I was always, you know, jumping around a little bit in uh, parts and. Uh, but I, I sang all over the place in, in, in Brussels in La Monet with Tony Papano. I sang in Amsterdam uh, through uh, four different productions. I sang in Aix-en-Provence, in the Bregenz Festival in Tokyo. In, you originated uh, lots of productions too and part yeah. of well, I found later um, that I was quite, when I was fest, I didn't want to do any of the contemporary music. And then after um, I started to do some contemporary music and one of the first things I did was Hosokawa's Hanjo. I did the world premiere and we did a co-production with Brussels La Monet and the festival in Aix-en-Provence with um, Anna Teresa de Kirsmacher, the choreographer from Belgium. And that was an incredible experience to create a role of Jitsuko Honda was her name. Mm -hmm. her name. And um, it was a, a very, uh, we worked sort of as dancers. So it was a very stylized production in a way because of how, how she said it. Um, and, uh, and I ended up actually doing that production in Brussels, X, Lisbon, Amsterdam, Milano, Torino. No, not, I'm sorry, not Milano. No, uh, Amsterdam, uh, I did it, where else? Um, Lyon. I did another production of Hanjo in, uh, in Milan and Torino and Tokyo. So um, yeah, it was a wonderful thing to learn that part, to create that part. So did it take, uh, it. did you have those musical skills or did you have to develop them? I apparently had them. I so mean, you got I had at Vassar or just through yeah, your own education. I, think, I, I mean, I studied piano from the age of five to 18 and I don't have perfect pitch, but I have sort of relative pitch, but I, there were a lot of tritones. <laughs> I know there are. <laughs> and so my way was using Maria. So <laughs> there was a Maria, an upside down Maria or, uh -huh. or like, you know, a, a big uh, second was, you know, hello, Dolly. So I don't remember <laughs> my little tricks, but I, I some, I, I guess I have a good ear. It, it, it's, you know, I, I ended up relying a lot on on my intuition in every way. I did that through my whole career, and um, and it was in there someplace. And actually. I really have enjoyed, I, I sang Ligeti, I've sung Tan Dun, I've sung, um, uh, what else have I done? I mean, a lot of, I ended up doing a lot more contemporary music um, and it's fantastic. It's How really about Baroque fun. music? Have you, David, I can't remember. You know, the only Baroque, I did only um, Handel Sem Semele, I sang Juno Aino, and then I did like all of the Bach Passions, mm -hmm. some Magnificat, so um, I recorded the B minor mass, but no, it never, somehow, I think my voice was a little bit too big and I a little, a little too voluptuous. Yeah, it was a little bit, you know, and then they started to cast countertenors, right. some of the things. So I, I love Baroque music and I would have loved to do, you know, there were so many beautiful Handel roles. And However, it sounds like no regrets. You've really had a really no. spectacular career. No, I have. I have still, there's like still a few roles that I'd love to do before uh -huh. retiring. Uh, well, there's, there's no need yet. to. You still sound yeah. fabulous. You still look fabulous. So there's no reason uh -huh. why for you to stop unless you decide at some point I've done all I need to do. Yeah, no, I think, um, yeah, no, it's, it's interesting after it's been 20, I've been singing for 25 years. Many of my colleagues who started with me have 
you know, retired long ago. They're, mm -hmm. they're, teaching, they're doing other things, but, and I'm, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm interested now in a few other things, which is, you know, why we're talking now in a way. And, um, but I, I still, you know, I, I'm not finished with singing and there's right, still exactly. music that I would like to do. And I have done one woman show of, uh, you know, Bern music of Bernstein and Cord Weill for Broadway called One Touch of Genius that I wrote for the, for the Bernstein Centennial. And I have a couple of other one woman show things I'd love to do. And there's still like lots of art song that I would love to do in, in recital. So there's, there's lots of, lots of stuff left yeah. and uh, a quintuple threat at least well I don't know. <laughs> it's just you know but on the other side i don't there there are some things that is better to let the the new young singers go through sure sure, sure. Mm -hmm. but right. you know clitum nestra and electra or you know Waltraut or, or uh, Graf and Geschwitz. I did the mm -hmm. Gymnasiast in in lulu but i never got to do Geschwitz. and so mm -hmm. there's a few like really meaty wonderful roles that I would love to try. Right. So and you know, there's no point in doing these 20 year old characters or 15 year old characters oh. anymore. Because okay. also the biggest fear I remember Leontine Price saying is being compared to your younger self. Right. Well, oh, the, absolutely. And, and actually, I mean, there's, it's interesting, maybe it's one of the one of the um, signs of maturing, finally, <laughs> where there's a long time where you you know, you keep thinking you can still do th this stuff. And, and actually, because my voice is a kind of, I mean, the character of it is it's a kind of a lyric, it's a lyrical sound, it, it has drama, but it has a beauty to mm -hmm. it that's sort of special wonderful. about it. And, and, um, and so some of those really romantic roles, you know, still suit me, but but to be honest, as an actress, I'm more interested now in the meteor women uh, mm -hmm. to play like I, I don't you know Carmen she's a wonderful person but you know after a hundred times <laughs> I, I still think it's one of the greatest operas ever yeah but, uh, but I'm not interested in doing it again I mean there's a lot of roles I, I you know that I loved but I wouldn't want to do anymore mm -hmm. you know but, but then there are these few Didon you know there's a few oh. that would be really that you're right that you're ready to bite off yeah. Um, so you're now going to be dividing your time more between the America and, um, and, and Berlin. Yeah. I mean, I have a, a place in both and I'm in, I'm sort of, I mean, we, one of the things that I'm interested in and one of the things that's sort of a, um, reaction of the pandemic is it's made all of us think about, especially in the performing arts and in classical music, it's brought about a crisis, of course, because we haven't been able to perform live for a year so. We've all been searching for ways to get our music out there. And, um, and I think it sort of brought to a head perhaps the difficulties of the classical music business, because in general, um, I, I believe we, we need to get new audiences, bring more people into the theater. And that means thinking about how to change how, what we do. What are opportunities? How can we find uh, new ways to bring young people in We've had these wonderful older audiences who who have been around, but they're getting older. They won't be around forever. They won't be around forever, and um, and so I am very curious to take part in how classical music develops for the future. This mm -hmm. is something that I think I can perhaps uh, be more effective, not just singing a part on the stage, but to be on the other side. Um, I'm not quite sure yet in what capacity, but. Um, but to see, you know, how I can help performers communicate better, maybe uh, arts companies uh, have a, a way to get out into the into the community in a different way. Um, so I've been investigating what I could do. And um, I had a radio show on the American radio station in Berlin called Light Motifs. It was conversations with people who make a life in classical music. And um, the radio station closed, unfortunately, it was KCRW Berlin. But um, I'm now working on a new podcast with um, another group. Uh, and then I'm going to do a um, global leadership program, which has to do with bringing music um, in, in sort of social impact with music. 
And I've decided to, to do that, which will be on the side oh, wow. and kind of open up uh, to find out, I guess, a sort of learning entrepreneurship and understanding how to put a company together. And, um, and then when you asked me if I would be interested in being on the board of Catapult, um, this was another opportunity to maybe have some influence on the other side mm -hmm. stage. I mean, we, we did this fantastic production together in Gotham of, of The Raven, which was mm -hmm. an amazing experience. Probably another one of my favorite uh, productions that I ever did. Fabulous. Uh, uh, you know, mine too. With Alessandro Ferri and, mm -hmm. and uh, working with Luca Vegetti and we're getting to work with you. Mm -hmm. Um, but sorry, sorry, go ahead. So it's, I was going to say, so it sounds like there's a real alignment between your interests moving forward or your goals moving forward yeah. and Catapult's goals. Yes, exactly. I mean, that's what kind of um, really attracted me to Catapult because, you know, you are, you are accepting that opera is kind of not going to be the same again. I mean, right. I, I think, you know, this, I mean, of course, we will still go into the sacred theater and sit in the dark theater and and watch opera, but uh, I think it's I think we we have to find new ways to get out there, whether it's filmed uh, operas actually written for film, as as you did have already done with Glitch, or you know mixed media or mixed genre productions or shortened versions. You know, there's so many things, and um and so that's. That's what, when, when you asked me, I thought, oh, this is perfect <laughs> because. And also I think uh, now that you're looking into the future, you might be able to see from an organization such as ours, what the various possibilities are within the industry. Yes. Rather and, than just being singing on stage. Yes. And I think also um, what I think is, is useful about me is that because I've worked both in Europe, in America, I think I have a, an experience that has, you know, exposed me to many different things and some of the American style, it, it's quite different actually mm -hmm. in the different areas. And I think that I hope that I can bring a little influence of, of what I've experienced over here, you know, working with the actors, with choreographers, working in, you know, with contemporary orchestras, working in um, smaller venues, you know, theaters where you actually acting is really important because, mm -hmm. you know, if there's only a thousand seats or 800 seats, it makes a difference what your facial expression is doing, where at the Met, it's a whole other, it's a whole other story. I'm, I'm totally grateful for your input continue, uh, moving forward because the other thing is you've got such a huge broad perspective, not just European and American, but even within America and within Europe, you're, you're, the people who you relate to and have as friends is a huge broad um, swath of people with very broad interests, not just musicians, not, yeah. not, not necessarily opera lovers, but people who are no. people love music. Yeah. And that's, I mean, it's something that, you know, actually moving to Berlin in 2010 was a really fantastic uh, change because here is sort of a center for artists in general. So, you know, I have friends who are, uh, one is a fantastic, she's a smell artist. She just had a piece at the Architecture Biennale in Venice. An olfactory artist. Yeah, I, I mean, she uses smell, uh, you know, it, it, I mean, not aroma, but actual smell and, and, you know, the heritage of some smells and how we feel when we smell, I think. And, and then, you know, I have a lot of, I've set designer friends, painter friends, sculpt, there's a sculptor friend who, who's done a lot of set, uh, sets for opera, who is very close to all these contemporary composers. He's done a couple of pieces at the Y. I mean, there, there's a lot of people here who are experimenting, who are trying, who are write, librettists, I know, who have written librettos for operas, and, and of course, lots of directors. And, um, and over 25 years, a lot of the people I started with are now running you know, opera companies and, um, or they're now the, you know, pretty big conductors um, all around. And it's, it's, um, yeah, there have been wonderful colleagues and there, and, and what's sort of great here is um, life is a little slower. So you, and, and people like to sit around and have dinner and talk until two in the morning. And, and it's, it's really, um, yeah, it, it's, it's a really wonderful environment to share ideas and, and it, this really appeals to me as, 
you know, as we started as the kind of humanist that I am. Yeah, you've also brought that back to New York too. I, I've been well, at I, dinner parties at your home with all these incredibly interesting people and discussions, really well, interesting discussions just happen. Well, I, I hope, I mean, it's what, it's what I enjoy um, uh -huh. you know, the most. I like to be, um, you know, stimulated and surrounded by people who are doing interesting things because it makes me learn and opens up my mind to things that I would never have thought about. And um, so I, you know, I just hope it continues. So this is, this is, you know, a wonderful way that, that I hope you might do, I might drive you crazy sometimes when no, I give a suggestion of something. No, that I you'll appreciate say, it. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, you've yeah. done that in the past, and I thought, hmm, and then I thought about it, and it's been right. So I, <laughs> I, I, so I, I, I appreciate it. Of course, my initial instinct is, why is somebody rocking the boat? But then I think right. about it, and I take it in, and and I, you, you come from a place of now of wisdom, and of caring, and what what more right. can one one want? Also, I think because I'm a New Yorker, as a New Yorker. We have, a, when I lived only in New York, we have a kind of a feeling that everything in New York is the best, that we, you know, that the, the, the top of everything comes to New York. And I realized even moving to Bremen, Germany, which is a small provincial town, but had a very old tradition of opera and music and arts. I mean, you know, I'm in a country where every little town has an opera house and a symphony orchestra. And, you know, I think sometimes, um, in America, there's also this question versus Europe of public funding versus private funding. And, and there's some things that it's not as easy to accomplish um, because of private funding. And, and you, you know, you're maybe a little bit more responsible to the people who, who are supporting your work. But um, and we're here, you know, all, you, it used to be, it's probably changing here too. You know, there was just an artistic freedom to try anything and it could be a complete disaster, but you know, the theater was still paid for and it didn't matter if you sold tickets or not. Um, mm -hmm. So I think having the exposure to all of these potential things, I mean, some very ugly disastrous uh, productions, but, uh -huh. but at the same time, I think, um, I think what we want to do for the future is innovate and we yes. want to start a conversation and we want people to come in to catapult and say, wow, I never saw, I never listened to music that way. I never saw an opera that made me think in this, in this manner. And, and, you know, also I want, I, I, I hope that, you know, the audience is moved by the beauty of the sound of the singers and the music and what's happening on the stage. But at the same time, that that they walk out and and it's changed the way they they think about something whether it's opera in general whether it's the piece that that you're doing or whether it's um even just you know how performers work um there's so many levels uh that that i think it, it, it's such an opportunity it's so exciting yes um a very very brief story about uh, my former company, when early on, we didn't have that many donors because it was a new company. And one of my key donors, one of the largest donors after a performance, I think it was one of an early production, I think it was a Martin New Double Bill. He called me the next day and said, can you come into my office to talk to me? And I said, oh, great. You know, I thought, oh, uh, he wants to <laughs> yeah. share, share his, his feelings of, of joy at the success because I got a great review in the paper. So I went to his office and I said, so what did you think? And he said, it wasn't my cup of tea at all. I really didn't like it. And I went, my face just dropped because we were really, I really needed. Yes, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he said, however, if you're going to do it, it needs to be done this well. It, New York needs to have productions like this. So I'm going to double my donation for next year. Amazing. That's so an amazing said, person. Just because it's not my taste doesn't mean it's not other people's taste. And I think it's important that that this be carried on and um I mean, this important. is the thing about art, you know, chacun a son goût, that, you know, everybody's taste is different, but mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that you can't be exposed to something different and, and get something out of the performance, even just to say, I hated that. And, uh -huh. and I think part, one of the things in, um, I learned in Bremen, sometimes there'd be these just shocking performances, but they were exciting events. People would be getting up and slamming doors and <laughs> and actually audiences came to see that, you mm -hmm. know, they came to see these outrageous uh, things that, that were being done and some were brilliant, um, even though 
they were kind of disturbing uh, mm -hmm. and and provocative. So mm -hmm. there's a place for it. Yeah. Not always, so maybe a little harder to do that in New York, but well, but, um, I, but, I prefer to be provocative emotionally. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you have to have something ugly on the stage. I think aesthetically. Yeah things shouldn't be ugly, but they don't have to always be beautiful and traditional. And, 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 uh, and I think, yeah, I, I, I think intellectually provocative and emotionally provocative is, mm -hmm. is also, you know, art doesn't have to be that, but that's one side of art. And, and I think, you know, Catapult has such an opportunity to explore. To to explore so many things. And, and, and now with the opportunities of, of uh, film and different locations and different genres, you know, there's, you know, it's endless what you can do. Well, for Vika, I've got to say, I just value you in every way as a person, as a board member, as an artist, all of this. And I'm just, you've enriched my life enormously and I can't thank you enough for our time together. You're an inspiration and I'm sure you will continue to be. And Thank you so much. Uh, Neil, thank you. It's it's also such a pleasure to get to work together again on, in yes. another way. And after having such a long friendship, it's 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 a joy. So I'm looking thank you very so much. Continued forward success. to the future of Catapult. Thank you so much. Bye. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.